Great. Well, good evening, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're very excited for tonight's program. Uh, Chasing Chandler is the Tewksbury Library Haunted. Uh, before we get going, I just wanted to mention a few quick logistical things. Uh, first of all, we're in Zoom webinar mode tonight, so uh, the panel cannot see you or hear you. Uh, if you have a question for the panel, you're going to want to type that into the Q&A box. And if you have a comment for the panel, you're going to want to type that into the chat. Uh, we, will, we will try to address as many comments and questions at the end of the presentation, uh, but the audience will remain unseen and unheard. Um, uh, additionally, um, we will be recording tonight's presentation. I want to stress that the Zoom camera is just focused on the panelists. It will not pick up anyone from the audience. Again, we cannot see you or hear you. Uh, you'll be receiving an email from me tomorrow morning with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please take 30 seconds and fill that out. Let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Uh, also in that email will be a link to um, the recording for tonight. So feel free to pass that along to anyone who you um, think may be interested. Um, tonight's panel is donating their time. Uh, but in general, I want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library for sponsoring all our programs here in Tewksbury. And tonight, I have a list of about 10 libraries that I wanted to thank and acknowledge uh, for partnering with Tewksbury and for helping spread the word uh, for tonight's event. And those libraries are Boxford, Clinton, Draket, Lowell, Merrimack, Raleigh, Stoughton, West Newberry, and Hudson, New Hampshire. So we thank them very much. Uh, and then lastly, just to set expectations, I anticipate the program lasting approximately an hour. Uh, we might go a little long or a little short, but we're going we're gonna to aim for an hour or so. Um, we're going to have um, a couple of uh, different speakers uh, sharing uh, presentations. Uh, and then, as I said, we'll take questions and comments at the end. All right, so let me um, do a brief introduction here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie. Uh, so just for some background, uh, several current and former employees of the Tewksbury Public Library believe it is haunted. Over the past 10 years, there have been reports of unexplainable phenomena, from shadowy figures to whispering in empty rooms to falling books that seem to defy the laws of physics. Uh, the library, as many of you know, uh, hosts its annual Fall Fright Night series, a series of paranormal programs, something we've been doing for over 12 years now. And uh, many of the paranormal investigators and mediums and other presenters that we've hosted have often sensed something at our library. Uh, the library was built on land that once belonged to the Tewksbury State Hospital, uh, and there are two uh, hospital cemeteries nearby. Uh, library staff uh, has affectionately named this uh, potential ghost Chandler uh, after the street that the library is located on uh, with the belief that Chandler is a relatively friendly ghost. And uh, in September, uh, the library commissioned several investigative groups working under the, under the umbrella of Moonlight Paranormal Productions to gather evidence of any supernatural being haunting the library. Uh, this hand-picked all-star team of paranormal researchers included Heather Wheeler from Old Souls uh, Paranormal, uh, Al, uh, oh, Al, here I go, Al uh, Gun, uh, Guncalves, uh, Rick Smith and Valet, uh, Vanessa Delgado from Colonial Spirit Investigations, uh, as well as Becky uh, Morganelli from Moonlight Paranormal Investigations. And as I said, th this was an umbrella um, led by uh, Moonlight Paranormal Productions founder, uh, Bonnie Pulver. Uh, so this team, which again donated their time, uh, is here tonight to produce their findings, uh, which will include all sorts of things that go over my head. I'm, I'm not quite sure what to refer to some of these things are, uh, uh, but, they're, but they're essentially uh, videos and, and photos and uh, uh, EVPs and other test results. And um, so I, uh, you know, let, let's, uh, for those of us here uh, watching live on Facebook and on Zoom, and those that will watch uh, later on demand, uh, including on YouTube, uh, let's give a Big virtual round of applause to um, Bonnie, Heather, and Al for being here live with us tonight. And uh, Bonnie, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Good evening, everybody. It's great to have everybody here. 
very excited that so many of you from so many different places have come to visit with us tonight to hear our stories. So I wanna thank you, Robert. Um, it's wonderful and exciting um, that so many curiosity seekers have joined this presentation tonight. And I, yes, my name is Bonnie Palver, and I'm the director and producer for the Moonlight Paranormal Productions Company. Uh, by day, I work as an anxiety relief strategist, and I help people with their anxiety and, you know, to reach their goals and realize their dreams. And by night, I am a paranormal investigator. I have a long-standing personal relationship with the paranormal since I was about two and a half years old and continue to have experiences until today. Uh, I spent many years looking for answers, developing theories of my own, uh, and you know I'm very grateful for the learning and for the quest in finding the answers, which could take the rest of my life, but I'm going to keep doing it. So the Moonlight Paranormals Film Company is dedicated um, to supporting and promoting historic preservation and, and restoration. Uh, this film company creates inclusion and collaboration and building relationships between historic sites and professional paranormal groups for the purpose of fundraising for historic preservation and restoration. And we promote professional video, um, we produce, excuse me, professional video uh, presentations of the evidence that we find and we collect it and present it in such a way that further furthers the viewer's connection to the sites, the people, the places, and the stories. By supporting this mission, we're able to provide additional options for historic sites to fundraise. So let's get down to our story here with Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, for those of you who are not from this area and have never been to the library, um, this the building uh, that houses the library and the library collections is about approximately 20 years old. And it's located about 21 miles north of Boston in Middlesex County. Uh, the community of Tewksbury is um, very rich in colonial heritage, dating from the earliest years of English colonization. And Tewksbury was first settled in 1637 and was officially incorporated in 1734 from Billerica. Uh, it was also named after a town in England with the same name, Tewksbury. So for the first 90 years of its existence, the Tewksbury Public Library shared quarters with this other, you know, in other town facilities. Um, so in 1967, the public library moved from cramped quarters in the town hall to its own one-story brick structure. This building was renamed the Harold J. Patton Public Library in honor of a library trustee. The library experienced considerable growth in collections and library services during the following 30 years. And in 1999, moved into a new building on the grounds of the Tewksbury State Hospital, which is now one quarter of a mile south of its previous town center location. At that time, the institution's name was reverted to the Tewksbury Public Library. And so, here we are at the Tewksbury State Hospital, which uh, the, 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 the campus actually spans about 700 acres. Um, it was first opened May 1st in 1854, and the State Alms House at Tewksbury was the name. Uh, the purpose was to provide economical care for the poor in the state. Originally designed to provide for 500 uh, by the end of 1854, uh, 2,200 had been admitted into the program. In 1883, there was an investigation and in the program, um, you know, into the operations uh, and the structure, and the program continued um, until, uh, let's see. Oh, and the name was also changed to Tewksbury State Hospital uh, to provide for the inclusion of mentally ill, sick, and infectious disease patients. So they expanded significantly. The hospital remains in operation today, providing specialized care in the Thomas J. Saunders building. The campus grounds hosts various governmental agencies and community organizations. Many of the original wooden buildings were demolished in 1970. And uh, very, very recently, 
A pictorial and informational history is provided in a new book as part of the Images of America series published this year and authored by Ashlyn Rickard Werner, who is also a historian and is also on the board of the Public Health Museum. And uh, she also co-authored this with John Maynard. And we, as soon as we heard about that book, we snapped that right up, believe me. Uh, Amazon, great place. And the library also carries the book. The history of the campus, uh, where the library is now located, speaks to the observances and experiences of the staff here at the library. The staff call their experiences Chandler, named after Chandler Street, as Robert mentioned. The staff have also reported, as Robert mentioned, seeing the apparition of a woman, books being moved and knocked off of shelves, uh, witnessed books or materials moved through the air, heard noises and have experienced being touched. We were invited by Robert to come and investigate the activity. Over a period of three nights, a hand-picked crew of investigators, to include myself, spent approximately 18 hours of investigation time in the library. Investigative crew members, Heather Wheeler and from Haunted Emporium, Old Souls Paranormal, and, and, and Al Gonzalez uh, from Colonial Spirit Investigations, will present the evidence that we collected for your consideration. Over my experience and the overall experience that I had and uh, the observances that I made while here at the library, um, leads me to consider the history of the grounds. Um, there is more than one presence that they, uh, you know, they are transient um, throughout the grounds and have perhaps sought some novelty in the experience of their new environment and exploring the library and welcoming it as a part of their existence. So they just wanna be noticed, they just wanna be heard um, they would be drawn here by the influx of people and the positive experience that the library can offer. And the library has a long part in the history of this town and is now even more so since moving to this location. Um, I would especially like to thank the Tewksbury Public Library and administration. Robert Hayes, our resident skeptic, for inviting us into this opportunity. Also, I'd like to thank Noel Bach, um, who has uh, taken employment elsewhere, um, but she was definitely part of giving us part of her story and her experiences here at the library. Uh, Danielle Driscoll and Christine Hollis for sharing their observations and experiences. And last but never least, Chandler and friends. And I'm so, so very excited that you're all here tonight uh, with us. And I wish we had more time to discuss this further However, time is a factor. If you have any questions or interest in the behind the scenes experiences, please send me your email to the moonlightparanormalproductions.com address. And uh, if enough of you show interest, um, you know, I, we may put together a little program for you. And if you've always wanted to be an investigator, but it makes you a little anxious, you can also contact me at the same address, um, but just put Ghostbusters as a reference in there so I'll know that you attended this program. So thank you all so very much. Heather, take it away. Thanks, Bonnie. Hi, everybody. I am Heather, and I'm going to be sharing my screen with you to give you a portion of our evidence that I captured. Um, I do apologize in advance because due to the different cameras and the different audio recorders being at different spaces around the room, some are louder than others and easier to hear. Um, but the ones that are really soft, I did um, go ahead and put some captions in there for you. And I'll open up each clip with uh, just a little paragraph so you know what you'll be looking at. And let's see, so for the first slide that I have is actually an EVP that we captured in the children's room on the second night of the investigation early on um, I asked asked a question and got a response the EVP which stands for electronic voice phenomena comes just after I raise my hand to touch the device that I'm holding 
This is a voice that is not heard in the moment, but turns up in the recorded playback. The clip will repeat in a shorter version and then again just after the EVP with just the EVP with boosted audio. So I hope you all heard that we got a hello there at the end um, after we let them know that we came to talk to them. And the next clip I'm going to show you, um, I have labeled the bug and the orb. Uh, this clip also takes place in the children's room. You will hear Becky off camera telling me about an orb that she had seen. During this time, there is an example of a bug that moves very quickly in and out of the IR, which stands for infrared um, beam from my camera. Then you will see an orb that comes directly out of my neck and moves, off, moves to the left off screen. It does not appear affected by the IR beam. Orbs are a touchy subject in the paranormal world, as most can be debunked as dust, bugs, or lens flares. This one was different for starting on screen out of nowhere and producing his own light as it moves out of the beam of light. The bug is gonna happen very quickly, so I do apologize if you don't see it, but it will be right where the arrow is pointed. And then there'll be a little red box that will kind of highlight where you wanna be looking for, and it will be starting, like I said, around my neck and moving to the left off of your screen. I'll play it one more time because I know the first time I showed it to some people, they didn't really see it that well. So I'm just going to go ahead and play it again. Whoop, no. And I swear I saw like an orb. And then I saw a couple others just like it around the light. I tried debunking it, but I, I couldn't. So the next clip, we we're in um, we had moved and we get to how many we think or we were told were there um, so in this clip we moved into the media area at the rear of the first floor bonnie is off camera to the right and i'm sitting on the left using the phasma box app with headphones this app produces phonetic sounds that can be formed into words i'm listening for any word i hear then i call it out I cannot hear the questions Bonnie is asking. This is a modified version of what we call the Estes method. Traditionally, I would have also been blindfolded to further disconnect me from what was happening in the room. By this time, we had started to suspect that we were dealing with a larger number of spirits than we first believe. I provided captions as Bonnie can be hard to hear off screen.
So the next clip we have called Ghost Shoes, during the same session as the last clip, we had a strange event happen. Um, the app that I'm using has voices that have a real strange electronic quality to them. I was shocked when I heard a voice that sounded exactly like Bonnie speaking in her natural tone come through the headphones. As I'm telling her, that it sounded like her, I also say that it said ghost shoes. I thought that was strange, a strange thing to say, but it meant something to Bonnie. You see her at the right of the screen, shine her light down on her feet. She was also a bit shocked by the words it said. What I didn't know at the time was that she actually called the pair of shoes she is wearing her ghost shoes. As investigators, we often find ourselves walking in a variety of conditions some of us have a set of shoes that we always wear on investigations to be ready for any of those conditions. Wow, Bonnie, that voice just sounded just like yours that just came through. What? Something about ghost and shoes. That was wild. Really? So a moment like that is something that helps us as investigators um, to Bonnie and I in that moment validate. I said something that only she knew about and what I heard actually came through in her voice, which was something that should not have been possible to happen. And then also during the session, uh, Bonnie hears a little girl's voice um, off in the stacks where she was walking around to the right. She says that she heard it and I responded immediately with a female name. Bonnie is off camera to the right and a bit hard to hear in this clip. I've provided a caption for this clip. So again, just remember during this time that I'm sitting there, I can't hear um, what Bonnie is saying um, and everything I'm saying, I'm just hearing through the headphones and calling it out. So this next is a voice that we captured on audio. And this is a recording it was captured by Bonnie while she was still setting up her equipment with Becky. At the time of the recording, Bonnie heard it with her own ears. So this is not an EVP. Instead, it would be considered a disembodied voice. The clip is very quick. Bonnie is heard first saying, perfect. So then the voice comes and then Bonnie asks Becky if she heard it too. The voice has a breathy quality to it as these voices often do. So this is gonna be really quick. I'll play it um, a time or two. Perfect. So did you hear that? So it's right after the she says perfect so and then the breathy quality get my thing back to work perfect so did you hear that perfect so did you hear that all right hopefully you guys could make that out and this last little bit, so the last observation that I want to tell you about came during the first night of investigation. I don't have any video to go with it, but it was an interesting event. It happened in the children's room. I was sitting on the bench in the back corner of the room. I saw from diagonally across the room, something slowly peek up, peek over, peek up over the stacks at me. It was dark in the room and I couldn't make out any features. It just appeared like someone standing tall to look over and then shrink back down again. I had a device called an ovulus. 
I was using at the time. This device has a word bank that spirits can manipulate to produce words. I was asking whoever I saw if they could help me validate that they were talking to me by saying specific words. I asked them to give me a word like I or C. The device responded with Z. Phonetically, it does sound like C. Then I changed the words I was looking for to have something to do with books. The next response was index. Could they have been having a hard time using equipment that they've never seen before? Maybe, um, that was very early on. Uh, we hadn't been there the, the very first night, maybe two hours at that point. So we speculate that there might be a learning curve for newer spirits or spirits that are newer to interacting with investigators and equipment. It's hard to say for sure if these were actual spirit responses. This is unfortunately the case with a lot of interactions we have. We can only present the findings as it is. We'll only present the findings and it is up to everyone else to decide if they think they are valid. That can be frustrating, but it also, but it is also what keeps us going out and looking for new ways to try to prove that the spirit world is very much a real thing. I hope you enjoyed watching the clips as much as I enjoyed my time at the library. And that concludes my evidence and I will hand it over to Al. Thank you, Heather. Um, be kind of hard to follow after you after that. <laughs> um, so really quickly, let me just bring up my screen here. So uh, really quickly, so my name is Al Gonzalez. I've been doing paranormal investigations um, now going on 22 years. Um, I started back in 99 with a small group of three people with a pen and a pad and us just going through cemeteries and the woods um, just to basically get a feel for the paranormal. Uh, that turned into more of a hobby, uh, 2004, 2005, 6. Uh, we had a few more people interested. We started a larger group. That evolved to another group of 18 investigators in uh, uh, New Hampshire. And that's when I had my very first real experience at uh, Colby Sawyer College in New London. Uh, and that did it for me. Uh, after that point, I was hooked. Um, and I definitely wanted to continue uh, my research and understanding of the paranormal um, and to this day, I, I still feel like it's day one, uh, never get older. So uh, after that, uh, things happen. Sometimes groups, they go on their own way. So we had another group that we started here locally in Massachusetts. Uh, from there, went to another group out of Rantham. And uh, currently where um, I'm in is with the CSI and we've been partnering with uh, uh, Moonlight Paranormal uh, Productions as well as uh, Hunted Emporium. And, um, we uh, took on this task uh, to basically look into the Tewksbury Library to um, find out if any of these experiences, any of these uh, stories actually held any water. And I have to say, uh, definitely a lot of stuff happened that uh, for a person who actually works in technology, it was it's very hard to explain. So what I would like to do is before I give you the uh, um, actual evidence, um, I want to just basically give you an idea of exactly what the equipment is that we were using to capture this evidence. So the evidence um, that I'm going to be presenting is actually used through a connect system, which if you have children, you understand uh, it's the Xbox 360, those cameras, and you can see this little child in the bottom uh, has all those little dots. Those are lasers. Uh, and what this is, is this is a LiDAR technology. Uh, LiDAR technology is used every day it's a very reliable technology they use it for mapping fields they use it for gaming um, it's actually in the smart cars this is what keeps the cars basically from um, colliding with pedestrians or if you not if you don't see somebody hitting their brakes it actually activates the braking system so this is a very reliable technology and it's been used for some time now um, you know unfortunately it's just kind of dumbed down to a video game but the technology is the same and the sensors are very reliable uh, there's been a lot of research uh, behind it so um, the idea is that uh, throughout the day um, of the investigation, we walk through uh, 
the perimeter of the building. We walk through the corridors and uh, there's two different patterns that you get. Uh, one, you start seeing that basically the walls might be painted blue, the grounds might be painted green. The colors really indicate different uh, anomalies. Uh, it, it's, it hasn't detected uh, a person or potentially an entity, but it's just that's to pick up some kind of an anomaly. Um, and what's really interesting, what really we look for is when it picks up an anomaly where there shouldn't be anything. Like sometimes, you know, if you have a coat rack, if you have a chair, yes, it can happen. And there's ways to debunk that. There's ways to figure out, is it picking up the chair or are we actually looking at a potential entity? So uh, one of the things is change our angle. Um, if you change your angle and it's still there, then it's, it, there's no way it can be picking up uh, that same type of form, that same type of uh, structure. Um, so this is a technology that's been around. I'm sure you've seen it all in the shows on, on TV. Uh, they've actually advanced a little bit. There's actually a couple of new um, upgrades. That they've gone from the SLS now to XLS. Uh, it's just basically what you see here in the right. Uh, it's just a more advanced system. It does better 3D rendering. Um, it also actually now has fingers. You can actually see the fingers um, of the entity as well. The joints, there's more joints. It's no longer basically just one stick. Now you have actual wrists, you have elbows, uh, neck, hips. Um, unfortunately, the technology is so good that it's very hard to actually get it to work in investigation because the equipment is just very power hungry and you really need a very expensive equipment. So we try not to use that because essentially the technology is the same. Um, I mean, getting more detail of an entity is not going to change the fact that we're making contact or communication with an entity. So the evidence that I'm actually going to be presenting is uh, through a three-day period um, at the Tewksbury Library. And the first one here is day one. Uh, so day one here is basically a entity that was actually being mapped by one of the bookcases uh, downstairs. Uh, so really quickly, I'm just going to play and uh, I'll come back as soon as the video is done. So uh, just really quickly, so to kind of explain what we're seeing here, um, what happened is that the camera was picking up something in the LIDAR. Something interfered with the lasers and the sensors. Um, you're seeing all those lines all over the page. You didn't really map it. You really didn't capture it. Um, it, it's just very possible that it might have been in early stages of a manifestation or an apparition trying to basically manifest. Um, and you were just capturing the energy trying to basically form. Um, what's interesting here is if you noticed, Bonnie didn't really move. Um, she really made very slight little adjustments. Um, and, the, and the detection just disappeared on its own with very little interaction from her. Uh, she never actually even did any kind of debunking, which is uh, big shifts or even putting a hand in front of the camera to reset the laser grid. Um, on its own, it just went away. So uh, that evidence is actually you know, pretty interesting. And we, we definitely consider that uh, a possible contact uh, uh, piece of evidence because it just meets all our criteria.
So with that being said, let's go to clip two. As soon as I can actually just get to the next page. <laughs> so day one again, clip two. And uh, this is in the lobby. Um, and again, I apologize. We have this recording software. It's not the prettiest software, but it sometimes can get in the way of what we're trying to show. So please just bear with us. Um, I, I believe Bonnie does eventually move the camera. You'll be able to see a little bit better. So here's clip two. So in this clip here, um, a couple things happen. Um, if you kind of look at the book rack, it doesn't really have any distinguishing um, lines, uh, protruding parts that could make the LIDAR think it's a body um, or it's an arm or a head. Uh, they're, just, they're just horizontal lines, but yet the LIDAR picked up a vertical. As a matter of fact, at one point, uh, the actual stick figure went beyond the book rack uh, onto the carpet. Um, yes, it did go away. Bonnie shifted. Um, and unfortunately, I had a piece of evidence that kind of uh, backed this up where we were able to reproduce uh, the same issue. But unfortunately, um, one of the things that we were having is we were having equipment malfunctions. Uh, the recordings are every five minutes. If you don't stop and save, you kind of lose it. Go figure. <laughs> so, um, but you, you, this, in, this specific clip here was very interesting just because uh, looking at the bookcase, you can obviously see that it wouldn't um, send out any wrong um, signals to LiDAR. It doesn't move. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go down to day two, clip one.
so um, again, this was actually a very long clip, but uh, we felt it was actually very important to kind of see the transition between detection, communication. Um, another key piece of evidence is that we had Heather, who is also in the frame. You can see her on the right-hand side, which is what the sensor sees. What you see in the uh, black and white is actually uh, infrared. Uh, it's the same thing that a security camera would see at nighttime. And sometimes you can see little polka dots with the lasers. But in, in this case, you can see that she's actually in the frame, but something was in between her and the camera because it never actually detected her. It wasn't until whatever anomaly that the, the camera was detecting that eventually it started picking her up. Um, so it, it was just a very, very good piece of evidence. Um, I, again, you know, it, it's not perfect. A lot of these anomalies could be apparitions attempting to uh, uh, appear or basically manifest and uh, either they don't have enough energy or again, it could just be basically um, uh, some kind of, you know, attempt to manifestation. Uh, but yeah, so long story short, basically uh, you can see that she communicated with them. We got to say a couple of waves. We thought it was a very key piece of evidence. And uh, for that, we're uh, glad to be able to present it to you. So that's day two, clip one, and I'll go down to clip two. And Al, before you move on, Absolutely. can you just, uh, Al, can you just verify that for that first, uh, the, the, for the clip you just showed, uh, and I think Bonnie did confirm it in the chat just now, but that was on the second floor near the computers in front of the study rooms. Is that correct, Bonnie and Al? So Robert, actually for that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie. Uh, that was her piece of evidence. Yep. Um, she did state that it was, but I, I just don't want to misspeak. So Bonnie, sure. would you mind confirming that? Sure, sure yes, absolutely. Um, they showed up all three nights. So all three nights we were there. There were consistent appearances in that area. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Al. Problem. Thank you. Welcome. So um, real quickly, and I apologize for some reason, my puppy is going crazy in the background. So I apologize for the barking. Uh, but anyways, uh, so this one here is clip two. It's actually on the table. And I'll go ahead and play this key evidence.
So folks, so I cut that one a little short uh, just for the sake of time. Um, but what I really want to point out here is uh, Bonnie pretty much did exactly what we're trained to do. Uh, we detected anomaly, we moved angles, try to go to different regions and try to see if the same anomaly comes back. In this case, it didn't. But while she was trying to basically communicate with them, the anomaly now surfaced on a flat surface. That's a pillar. There's, there's nothing there. There's no grooves. There's no indentations. There's nothing that the LIDAR would actually be able to recognize as a stick figure. And, and again, this is the type of technology that recognizes um, anything basically uh, that's not supposed to be there like humans or so on and so on. So with that being said, basically, uh, you know, Bonnie was obviously, obviously communicating with them um, at first at the table. And now we have this one single figure that's really large. And just the fact that there's nothing there and it's very flat, there should be no reason whatsoever that the LIDAR should be picking that up. So um, again, just another really great piece of evidence uh, that the bunking was great. Uh, and for that reason that uh, we definitely felt that it was something that we wanted to show you guys. So uh, really quickly, I want to go down to clip three. This one's pretty quick. So again, um, another great piece of evidence. Um, the anomaly on the desk, which we've gotten several times, outside the, on the table. And then out of the blue, we get another anomaly on a flat surface on the ground. Um, just again, no reason whatsoever that the LIDAR should be picking up any kind of anomaly there. I mean, it's just literally a flat surface. So again, another great piece of evidence. Clip four. Again, same thing, just the anomaly on the table. And the anomaly is now jumping all over the room. Again, if this was any kind of furniture, um, coat rack, anything that could have been mistaken for an for a actual entity, it wouldn't have been going all over the room, ceiling, walls. Um, again, it's detecting something there. And I say something because it could be an anomaly, it could be an apparition, attempting to manifest, um, it could be many, many things. So again, another great piece of evidence there. Day three, clip one, is the rocking chair. So again, I'm gonna cut this one a little short uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, so originally the um, 
manifestation basically started taking on the form of uh, the chair and that's when we would kick in the debunking but it, it's almost like it actually now goes into other surfaces that didn't have any grooves or anything else and basically um you tend to start seeing it now manifesting in a whole different region of uh, the chair so again uh, just for the simple fact that basically it goes in different areas and the manifestation almost kind of responds to what bonnie was saying about uh standing up uh, again uh, we definitely classify this as a good piece of evidence. And again, another piece of evidence here, we have the stick figure on the table who seems to wanna to make a lot of contact. <laughs> um, and again, you know, for the folks on the call, um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to end it there, but it's just uh, basically that same entity that we were contacting on the table. And again, remember, you know, um, we're walking in pure darkness. We, we, we really can't see anything ahead of us. These tablets, they're only seven inches um, and in pure darkness, it's very hard to see um, where we're going and who's around. So unfortunately, a lot of times you see us basically like, oh, I don't know where I am or um, I don't know what I'm pointing at. And the reason behind that is we, we really can't see. Um, you know, we go into these areas in pure darkness. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and actually come down to my last slide here. Um, and I first wanna thank um, the Tuxedo Library uh, for this amazing opportunity. And um, again, everybody, thank you for joining us today. I'm very happy to be a panelist and um, showing you my experience and basically uh, what I experienced at Tuxedo Library and hopefully, um, We'll have more opportunities coming forward. So uh, that being said, happy, uh, safe Halloween, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bonnie, back to you. Hi, everybody. So that was uh, pretty interesting. Um, as I was telling the people in the chat room, uh, I've been using the SLS almost since it first came out, and I've gotten better and better at it um, and debunking as well. And, you know, any of you that are enthusiasts out there, you know, practice makes better, right? Never perfect, but better. Uh, and the activity that I saw, I have never seen before, ever. Uh, I, I just, I was just totally in awe. Um, we did a lot of uh, verbalization back and forth. If we ever do the behind the scenes, like workshop or whatever, you know, we'd be happy to share all that stuff with you guys. Um, but it, it was, um, very eye-opening, you know, the, 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 the SLS was behaving in ways I'd never seen, you know, and it was just doing what it's designed to do. And that's what my mind just couldn't wrap my head around, uh, what I was seeing and what I know that this technology is capable of. And I talk to Al quite often about these things and you can see why, cause he's a wealth of knowledge. And um, I am the biggest debunker. I will. Yes. I will sit there and try a hundred different ways of reproducing the evidence. So, yeah, so there's true. many times we've brought things to him and we end up walking away going, ah, <laughs> you know? but, you know, that's all part of it. That That's why we do this. So, Bonnie, but as before, I, yes. oh, sorry, Bonnie, sorry to interrupt, Bonnie. I just wanted to blow no, no. your mind um, and <clears> I wanted to let you know, I don't know if there's any connection here, uh, but we have a new staff member starting on Monday uh, and her name is Haley. And that is interesting because that's the name that you uh, thought you uh, heard. Uh, uh, wow. I don't know what the odds are of that, but uh, when you heard that, uh, um, she hadn't yeah. even been hired yet. She hasn't even started yet. And there was no way you would have even known that. So that's that's an interesting no. uh, coincidence no. right there. Um, that's more than a coinky dink. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. But let's uh, let's try to stay on the line for another 10 minutes sure. or so and take some questions. And Bonnie, you can uh, certainly um, ask and answer the questions. That, or, 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 I'm sorry, re read the questions. Uh, uh, there's there's already one in the Q&A and there's one in the chat. Right. And folks, okay. uh, feel free to um, get some uh, more questions in for Bonnie and uh, her, Heather and Al will uh, take 10 minutes and answer your questions. Okay, great. Um, we've got a question from Teresa here. Um, do any of these clips of activity coincide with the same areas where people have experienced something? Great question. Um, I would have to say yes. <laughs> In the case of this location, 
Absolutely. Um, I think that, uh, as I, I said, I mentioned earlier that, you know, all three nights um, that we were up there, there was activity in the same locations. Um, the only one that was different from that was the, well, actually I can't, well, the anomaly that was in front of the little bookcase downstairs in the lobby and the other anomaly that I caught in the downstairs, uh, what is it called? The fairway room? Yeah, uh, um, the fair, fair grieve wing. Close, close enough. Yes. <laughs> fair yes. Wing. Yes. Um, and that entity um, was definitely responding to me. I was saying, I was asking it if it was having trouble walking um, because it was kind of bent over on the floor or if it was kneeling. So I was asking it little questions while we were doing that. Um, but that would be the only time we saw uh, 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 an energy on the SLS in that room. Uh, Okay, so we have some other questions here. Uh, and, and by the way, um, just yeah. so folks, because you know, I don't know the ghost lingo and you don't know the library lingo, but um, the uh, bookshelf that uh, Alan you referred to in the lobby, that's actually a uh, book sale cart. The, our friends of the library sell books on those carts. And so that's what folks were seeing in one of those clips. So I just wanted to clarify that. All right, back to you, Bonnie. Sure, um, I have Chris here. Do you have specific uh, historical stories to explain who these ghosts are and why they are haunting the library? This is my interest since otherwise I don't believe in ghosts. <laughs> I believe in overactive imaginations. Love skeptics, absolutely. Good question though. Um, we can only surmise. Uh, based on the evidence that we collect, we can suppose, we can discuss, we can come up with theories. Um, there are, you know, coincidences, as Robert just mentioned, there's no way we would have known anything about uh, somebody by the name of Haley starting to work there. Um, little things like that. It's, it's a, lots of bits and pieces that we gather together to, to put together a puzzle, and we never really quite finish it. There's always missing pieces, but it's just the challenge of trying to put it together. Um, but that's an excellent question, Chris. Thank you so much. The historical piece of it, well, if you get the book, the Tewksbury State Hospital book, I don't know if you guys can see it right here. My background is disrupting things. Um, I don't know what stories are in there. I've actually contacted the author and I've, I've been having discussions with her, hopefully um, to develop some more uh, connections um, with some of the situation, uh, with some of the entities that we um, experienced there at, at the library. Um, there's plenty of things we could talk about on that that we didn't even um, discuss tonight because of time. Uh, let's see, Danny is asking, people have heard noises in the Fairgrave wing, Fairgrave wing. Um, uh, yes, Danny, because I can hear things like that myself. <laughs> I always think, you know, do I need to get my ears checked? What's wrong with me? But then when I play a recorder back and I hear what I heard on the recorder, I'm like, okay, I really did hear that. That was a disembodied voice. Um, that seems to be happening to me a lot lately. <laughs> but um, yes, uh, that is definitely, I would say you're hearing something. Um, that's easy to debunk with the HVAC being so loud because, you know, all that mixed white noise, sometimes, you know, there's pareidolia when you look at something and you, and you, you see something that really isn't there, but your mind, your brain is trying to make a pattern to make sense of it. I'm wondering if we can do that with our ears as well. Uh, um, I, up a, you oh, know what? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Start, no, I just had seen a question that popped up earlier and then I think we kind of yeah, Skip exactly. over it from Renee. Um, she said, do you believe that these entities are there during the day too, or can only, or can you only pick them up in the dark at night? I personally believe they can be there whenever they want to be there. Um, we tend to go to places at night because they're closed. Um, you know, they're not open for regular business or, there's not as much contamination, kids running around, traffic outside, just the 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 the, the regular um, rumbles of the day kind of going on. So that's tends to be why we do it at night uh, in the dark, just to try to bring things down to a quiet level. But spirits can do 
what spirits can do. True. You want to take one out? Sure. I'll, yeah, I'll take my daughter. Apparently she's asking me a question on chat. Awesome. <laughs> she asked me, how often do you find pretty active ghosts? Um, it depends. Um, it, it really depends. Um, we can go to a very active area and we can find absolutely nothing. We can go to an area that is claimed to be very active and we can pretty much catch a hundred things or nothing. And, 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 I, and the interesting part is, is it, I can't tell you how many times we've actually gone to a location, walked out of there disappointed, reviewed our evidence and we're like, wow, I can't believe that basically we didn't hear X, Y, Z. And, and it's amazing how basically um, when you really carefully sit down, listen to everything, um, how much you actually capture. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that you capture activity per se. I would say that basically it just depends. Um, and I, I'm a true believer in the atmosphere. If it's very energetic, especially like lightning storms or anything, it energizes, ionizes the air, uh, which mm -hmm. makes it easier for entities to communicate. Um, and, and also the equipment too. Uh, a, a lot of times, sadly, we are not able to go to a location with all of our great gear, um, cemeteries, for an example, it's very hard to find a 120 watt outlet, <laughs> volt outlet in a cemetery to plug in your CCTV and all your equipment. Um, but yeah, so basically I would say it's, it's, it, it happens. Um, it, it just really depends on the environment. If they enter, if the spirits want to talk to you, um, like, uh, Heather made a great point, you know, this is a new facility. I mean, maybe they don't know how to communicate. Maybe they don't know what the equipment is. We just don't know. Um, so I would say, unfortunately, sadly, in this field, it's a crapshoot. But um, with the right team and the right equipment, I'd say at least every single time we go out, we get at least something. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. But we always get something. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Um, there's somebody here who's asking what was on the library site uh, prior to it being built. Uh, from what I understand with my discussions with Robert, um, it was a field, uh, maybe farming field or just grass field. Um, but to our knowledge, there was no other existing buildings or um, anything on that particular piece of land prior to the building of the library. Let's see here. Uh, Ginny wants to ask, what experience have staff had and when was the last time somebody had one? Uh, good question. Um, some of the staff told me it was a period of over like five years. Um, they had different experiences at different times. Um, but I think in my discussions with them, they said the last time was two years uh, ago. Um, but I don't know you know, if I'm correct on in that or not. Um, so if I'm not, I do apologize for that, but that's what I- Yeah, Bonnie, um, I, I can chime point. in and, and I am like the right. worst person to represent the staff on this because as you know, I, I'm a bit of a skeptic, but right. there was actually even an incident just uh, a week or so ago where one of our uh, clerical assistants um, basically thought she saw a ghost. She thought that someone walked past the children's room desk and uh, she later found out that no one was in the room and uh, it was, she wasn't quite sure what she saw. So uh, th th things like that are happening all the time at the library. And to Renee's point, uh, many, many staff members, both past and present, uh, feel that they've experienced things uh, during the day while the library is open. So this definitely isn't just a nighttime phenomenon, but it is happening uh, during the day as well. And I would note, I guess it depends on your definition of day, but uh, if you notice some of the clips that Heather was showing, I mean, it was five or six o'clock in some of them. Um, you know, I think you guys started your investigation sometimes right at five or 5.30. So um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. And uh, we do have several uh, staff members on the call. So if folks want to, uh, uh, type a little something in the chat, uh, feel free. But uh, Bonnie does have, um, uh, uh, I think, written comments from at least three or four current or past staff members. And uh, perhaps mm -hmm. uh, this uh, presentation will, uh, um, maybe we'll get a few more staff members to document some of their, uh, some of their happenings. But anyway, it looks like we have about three or four more questions and let's go for another five minutes or so. So Bonnie, back to you. 
Sure. Uh, I've got a question from Teresa. Why do you think the entities started appearing 10 years ago um, when the library has been there for 20 years? Well, uh, that's a good question. I would say that spirits can do whatever they want to do, time and space really don't apply to them, I would think. Uh, so, you know, the other thing was something I mentioned earlier uh, was that uh, my sense is uh, that they, you know, discovered it there. There was some kind of activity in their environment, but with the building of the place and, you know, then they saw people coming or they, whatever it is that they experienced. And now it's now part of a place where they can go like everybody else, you know? And I think that um, it doesn't really, the time continuum doesn't exist in that situation. Um, that, that, that exists in our situation. Um, so maybe they have been there and we just didn't know it. You know, um, I really couldn't, I, I think that's pretty much up to whatever, what any, anyone would like to believe about that. That's a good question. Yeah, just to uh, jump in again, too, um, it, it, it's possible that it's been longer than 10 years, and the person that we'd want to reach out to there is Noel, our, our former assistant director and longtime children's librarian, who's, who's basically um, was there for almost 20 years, basically uh, when the building opened until recently. Uh, she, she would really be uh, useful to sort of narrow down the timeline. Uh, and, then, and then a current staff member in the chat just noted that several times uh, she's heard her name whispered, uh, and then when she turns around, there's no one there. So things like that, things like that. Uh, two more questions, Bonnie? Hey, Bonnie, uh, would sure. you mind if I answer um, those two? Yeah, absolutely, go for it. Thank right. you, Bonnie. Uh, so, I, um, <laughs> Jerilis, so Bonnie mentioned in the beginning, you can go to moonlightparanormalproductions.com. Um, <laughs> she'll be able to help you out with... Uh, that information. Oh, Al, Al, could you actually say the question out loud? Because people Oh, I apologize. See the yes, question. I am so That's sorry. Okay. Uh, the question about Daryl is was basically, how do you become a paranormal investigator? And uh, as I just mentioned, uh, um, Bonnie mentioned in the beginning, uh, you can actually uh, go to her page and there's information on there and she'll be able to guide you in the right direction. And the other one that I've actually really piqued my interest was, were there any spirit boxes used? it would be interesting to see if they tell us their name. So I actually asked to take this question because I had a very interesting experience. And unfortunately, we didn't present it to you because we don't really have evidence. Uh, we tried, uh, we carry body cameras to can they record what sometimes we don't capture because things happen so fast. Um, there was actually an incident uh, at the bottom of the stairs by the bookcase where I had the SLS, which is what the LIDAR is. We were picking up a stick figure earlier in the night we had downloaded a program that's um intended to be on the phone it's a spirit box but it doesn't use fm am frequencies it uses the internal uh sensors of the phone which is a lot more accurate than laptops you have the uh, the gyroscope you have the accelerometer you have the temperature uh gps and all that and those are sensors that entities can manipulate to produce words anyway so going back to uh what i was saying so we were in the sls at the bottom of the stairs and we had turned it off. Uh, we had done plenty of time investigation on it. And we were mapping this one entity and it was going back and forth, back and forth. It was a small, it looked like a small child. And out of the blue, somebody asked me a question. And not only did my phone wake up from sleep mode, it launched the application. Not only did it launch the application, it activated because you have to press start. On the phone, it said my name and it said back pocket, which is where my phone was. And everyone's jaws dropped. And I wish we had the evidence to show in this panel, but unfortunately we have only off camera evidence and we tend to dismiss that because we wanna show you things that we truly believe we can uh, produce evidence for you. So yes. Um, we did use it and we actually were very successful in some areas. Thank you. Um, quickly too, that same note, the couple of clips that I had thrown in there where I had the headphones on, 
I was listening to um, a spirit box and that's where I was pulling the number 83, the name Haley um, and that stuff coming through. So you just couldn't, you didn't hear it. I would had it on the headphones to try to let me focus only on that and not hear the questions that were being asked. And that program was on a laptop and it, it's uh, it's called Phasma Box. Yes. If for those of you who are interested. And it looks like Al's daughter is going to get the last question. Uh, <laughs> Kayla, uh, Kayla asks, so have you guys ever had any experience with being touched by a ghost? Yes. Mm -hmm. You want to tell them, Heather? <laughs> oh, I mean, I've been touched a couple of times. Um, I think the one time that really stands out for me was the very first time that I was ever physically touched by one. Um, and actually, Bonnie was with me. We were at we were in Rhode Island in um, at a mill and um, oh, we man. were standing. I can't remember the name of the mill, but we were standing and we were leaning Slater over. Mill. Slater, Slater Mill. Slater Mill, yes. Yeah. We were leaning by over old grounds. Um, where the little wheelhouse there. And Bonnie was right next to me. There was nobody behind us but a wall. And, you know, leaned over and the ghost got fresh and pinched my rump. And I stood up and, you know, shocked and tur turned around. And I, craziest thing <laughs> that's ever happened to me. Uh, in that's the awesome. chat, uh, Renee asks me if I've experienced anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I'm going to say, I look at, you know, I don't, at the time I didn't think so. Uh, I will say that there's been instances, quite a few instances over the last uh, 10 years or so, where uh, if I'm closing the building after hours, you know, I am adamant that I shut the light off, that I shut the door, that I put the key back, that I, you know, I, that I did everything. And then I'll come in the next day and the maintenance worker will tell me, hey, you forgot to do such and such. And I am like adamant that I shut those lights off, you know, so uh, I'm going to blame the ghosts, on, the ghosts on that. But uh, outside of that, I have to say, I can't, um, yeah, I can't really pinpoint something, but I'm pretty oblivious. So I'm gonna start trying to be more observant. And then there was another suggestion, that, was, that question was from Renee. And then Teresa says, boy, she'd love to see or hear all the employees uh, discuss their experiences someday. Teresa, Absolutely. I'll see what I can do uh, on that one. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, oh, we're, we're not gonna answer that question. Okay, so why don't we wrap it up? So uh, Bonnie, do you have any last words before we end the call? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think I do. Um, sure. And you know, Heather and Al, if you have something. Uh, what I'd like to say is that a lot of people, uh, when they hear about a state hospital, um, there's a lot of history and hype about sites like that. And we are very, very careful when we go into a site not to take all of those things into account. We go there with a fresh, a fresh mind and an open mind, no biases, and we walk in there with all the respect we can muster and conduct our investigation out of respect, not only for the site, but for the history and the stories that go along with it and for the entities that may inhabit those areas. So it's not just all about, you know, the, the negative side of paranormal. I'm not saying there isn't one, but when we go into a place, just because the library is on a state hospital grounds, there is nothing there at all that I could, that I feel or sense at all that is negative in any way. It's, it's a very homey type of a feeling. It's like they've made the, the spirits there at the campus have accepted the library and have made it a place for them to, in, to dwell. Great. Well, thank you so much, Bonnie. A big thank you to all your team and especially um, you, uh, Heather and Al, for being with us tonight. I uh, want to thank uh, my director who's on the call, uh, uh, along with my um, um, the maintenance worker for, for allowing us to stay after hours uh, three times mm -hmm. and, uh, and do all thank this. You. And um, want to thank um, all the staff members who shared their experiences with you. 
And uh, also want to thank the libraries of Boxford, Clinton, Drake, Lowell, Merrimack, Raleigh, Stoughton, West Newberry, and Hudson, New Hampshire for helping us promote tonight's program. Uh, for those who are watching live, uh, check out, uh, check your email tomorrow with a look for an email from me with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please take 30 seconds and fill that out. And I have a feeling this is probably not the last time we're going to hear from Bonnie, Heather, and Al. I just have a feeling. So I uh, want to thank everyone again, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. And happy Halloween. And uh, anyone who's local, trick-or-treating at the library tomorrow from 9 to 445. So hope to see you there. Thanks again. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye, all. Bye-bye.